everybody to Wednesday Night Live. We are recording. I like to show this little piece of paper in case you can't hear me. You can see. I've also got on it's upside here. Upside down, um, Sandy. Huh? It's upside down. Your sign. There you go. So, we're still recording. It's upside down or not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is um, my website, acedogsports.com. If you like the learning and you want to see what else we've got, you can go there. Uh, it'll be updated soon. And my email is sandy at acedogsports.com. If you have questions or suggestions, please email me there. It's also another way to get my, uh, to pay. If you um, don't like to use PayPal from the website or from the link, um, that we post, you can um, just mail me a check. It's sandy at acedogsports.com. So um, I do like, and I enjoy um, uh, screen sharing uh, this little uh, reminders thing. It's just going to be how I, I start every uh, meeting with a little reminder that um, don't uh, ever think think you're better off without the course map. You are better with having the uh, course map. My course map um, approach is connected with my walkthrough approach. And I look at the walkthrough as having three phases. Some of you guys remember me saying the Easter egg hunt. And that's basically the walkthrough when you're in class and there is no course map in class and you're hunting around for the little cones. Um, so um, with the course map though, that's phase one is checking out that map. And um, how much of my, um, let me just a second here, I gotta make a little adjustment so I can see the whole slide. If it's gonna let me. Okay, it doesn't want to. How much of my walkthrough can I enhance by using the course map effectively? Most of it, maybe all of it, but it's going to, um, that's going to change from uh, course to course. Uh, a golly, a weekend or so ago, they changed the whole course. Uh, that happens so rarely, it's barely worth mentioning. Can the course map hinder my walkthrough? Um, not as much as it can help, so you don't have to worry about that. The course map can hinder your walkthrough if you marry it. And if you, and if you let the things that have always happened, that will always happen, that are always a possibility, if you act like those things, like a jump isn't in the right place, or the judge had to move something because there's a muddy spot on the course, um, if you let those things bother you because you got so attached to your plan on the course map, then um, then then it could hinder, but that's, you don't need to go there. You don't need to do that. So phase one, after when you have that course map and after you've done the Easter egg hunt class for the numbered sequence, phase one is about the geometry. That's why you're looking at the course map. So you wanna learn the path and the flow of the course as a course. And I say that, when I say that, I mean not as, a indicator to your training skills or not as a um, reference to if you're feeling good about running that day, physical, like it's not the time to make decisions about turn cues. Um, it's just to look at how that particular geometry could flow the best. And I'll explain more about that later. It is not about you or the dog at all in the beginning. It is just the geometry. How does this flow? If I was drawing a pretty line and I wanted it to have flow with my pencil and it was only about pencil lead or ink, nothing to do with a dog or a human being whatsoever, that's what you're doing. Because if you try to pile it all on, your brain is gonna trick you and from seeing the flow of the, of the course. So I talk about the basic geometry being the line from obstacle to obstacle, which just means, and I'll show you on the map when we're talking about it for real, um, how the dog would take the jump 
in a way that made him lined up for the next one. So how his spine would intersect the bar. And then what I'm calling advanced geometry involves the stanchion plus the refusal line, either the bar to the refusal line for what's typically called a wrap or the refusal line to the bar, which is typically called a backside. So those are tight wraps around the stanchion, um, either from the front side or the back side. Then after you can tell the most flowy flow way of that particular course, then you can think about decisions. The sides of your body that you want your dog on, um, the sides of your body that you want the obstacle on. And when I'm saying that you want, I'm saying that you've determined is an advantage. It's an advantage to have the dog and the obstacle on this side of my body. And then the skills, your, how well are your obstacles trained? If you've got an obstacle that you can't handle at a distance, like the teeter or the weave poles or, or classic ones, then you, you're just, don't fight it. Just, you know where you're gonna be unless you're willing to take a, a, a risk that day. Um, it's your money and your time. So you can um, know where, how close you have to be to your obstacles, your directionals and your turn cues. You know, sometimes people want to try a new turn cue. Don't try something you've never done, but I call it, I call bait. Um, if I'm working on a new turn cue <coughs> in training and I see like the perfect spot to try it on a course that weekend, but I, not totally comfortable with it, I make a decision. Do I feel like going out on a limb? Is how important is this run? Um, I, don't, I don't go into this talk that I hear so much as a, well, I think I'll do it. You know, I, I, I think I'll do it. I think I'll be okay. No, come at it from, I've only practiced that a little bit and it might not work. And will I be okay with that? That's how I, I would, and you guys, we could do a whole session on how to feel good or bad about decisions. Um, there's way too much feeling bad in agility. Holy sweet Jesus, the, the, you guys, it's like golf. You're not going to be, never going to be perfect. And so uh, next week I have this idea that I'm going to show, I botched a run this weekend so bad and a friend texted it to me the other day and she's like sorry I didn't get any of your your good runs but I got this one you probably don't even want it and and I thought no I want it I want to show it I want to show how I botched it why I talk about why I botched it what went wrong for me and then um I want to talk about recovery because right after I I didn't just botch it a little I think I had I think I it was beautiful for about five obstacles um, and then I went in the next ring and won Grand Prix. So um, that's some stuff that I would like to share. How, how do you do that? How do you have the bad run and then, and then turn it around? And then there's the lanes, the paralleling, the converging and the peeling away. So to me, those are the only three things you can do with a, with a lane or path. Those, those are, I use those words interchangeably. We talk about the dog's path and then I travel. The dog's path is the path of the course. And then I travel in a way where I always know if I'm intending, because it's to my advantage, to parallel that path of the dog of the course, to converge on that path or to peel away from it and how I want the dog to respond? Do I need the dog to respond or do I need the dog to ignore? I have to have a way to say that for the dog. Then there's that precision walkthrough that um, I talk about every week to remind you that I want to make my decisions on course in three minutes. That's my goal. And so that means I want to have as much work done in that course map as I possibly can before I hit that walkthrough. Because I want five full minutes. You have eight minutes for your walkthrough. Sometimes you get more. Sometimes they let things be open forever and you can quote unquote walk it to death. And, and there's a lot more that I could share 
with you guys about process in the walkthrough. And um, that'll be another, another um, evening sometime. So the five full minutes is why I'm trying to get the dress rehearsal. Five full minutes, start to finish, over and over and over. You know, I, I want to be able to do it five or six times. I'm not running at full speed, but some people do. In Europe, they do a lot. So thank you very much for coming. Again, Sandy Day Dog Sports. If you get, if you subscribe to the newsletter, if you go to the website and sign up for the newsletter you'll get um, more information. I have a YouTube channel. It's Ace Dog Sports YouTube channel. We're on Facebook and Instagram. So um, check those things out. I really could use some more subscribers to that YouTube channel. All righty. Let's get rid of this and go straight to our course map. I wanna do something a little bit different tonight. Um, I, I just have one map tonight. And what I want to do is talk about the configurations as if um, I just thought I would expand a little bit and talk about like what else I would do with this course if I had it set, like what other things are there to practice. So. Um, can you guys all see the course okay? Thanks, Becky. And let's just um, talk about it. This is from October 9th of last year. The judge is Laura English. Um, today is April the 14th. And uh, that's for our, I can show you guys all that. And um, looks like it was in Tennessee. This is off the Facebook group. So this course started out with a um, pinwheel configuration. It's actually the pin, it's a pinwheel configuration, but the judge is having you do a full circle. And um, advanced dogs think that they're supposed to be side changes when we're doing circles like this. So um, I typically don't, like to be in the middle of anything. I will be when I need to be, when it's to my advantage. Um, but what we're looking at, and I'll explain more of that later when we get to handling decisions about what side I wanna be on. So this course goes one, two, three, four, and then five is the dog walk. So I know, so what I'm gonna do here is just draw this kind of no-brainer line. And this is the first time I've looked at the map. So now I'm noticing that it, it doesn't behoove my dog to run off of the dog walk. I wanna go as directly as I can. Um, this tire has to be approached just right. So I'm seeing that this could be, you know, pretty decent, nice line. And the lines, you guys, where your dog actually ends, lands, I'm sorry, not ends. I don't want your dog to end. I want your dog to land. How the dog's spine takes this bar is going to determine where he lands. If you just, if you're over here and you just call him off the table and he runs over to you and then you push him this way and he takes the jump like that, um, he's, it, it's, it, it, this line isn't going to look like that anymore. So this is real nice and straight, eight to nine. Nine to 10 is nice and civil. 10 to 11 is nice and, and civil. Now we've taken the tire twice. Wow, that's exciting. I don't remember taking the tires twice before. So this is where things get interesting because if you said, I wanna take the shortest line and have my dog go directly from the A-frame to that jump, the dog would be taking the jump towards this tunnel. And you actually need the dog to turn. This is now the, with the dog taking jump to tire, jump to tire from this angle, 
it's a lot softer than the dog taking the, you know, this is like a hard V, right? So you could say, well, if my dog came off straight a little bit, if my dog didn't go directly to that jump, if he came off a little bit, he'd be taking this bar a little more civilly, as I would say. But if I let him go straight, at what point is he going to think I'm cueing the, the teeter or table? Sorry, guys. So this is only 15 feet here. So if I let my dog go straight there, I'm going to have a, 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 a call off. I could put my body there and wrap him around. But I think I'm going to be better off to pretty much just go straight to that jump than to risk that off course. Now I wanna see where 15 is. Uh -huh. So now I know that I have to have a side change. Now we get to thinking there's lots of, lots of things come into play now as to which lanes we're gonna use. And the judge was clever. This is a trap jump, you guys. So you don't have this whole little arena here to use. So we're just gonna back burner those thoughts. The dog goes into the weave poles like this. So I take that into consideration. This is a classic wrap. Dog exits this way. So I'm going to be very mindful when I walk the course. Always remember that we're looking to see are the holes really there. If this hole was here, I've got a little bit more of a turn. You guys, we can get tricked by tunnels. Sometimes these, you know, the dog can exit. And if this hole is a little bit over here or over here, the dog might see that hole. So if you're up here though, this should not be any problem whatsoever. This is gonna be okay to manage. This is gonna be okay to manage. Oh, what did our judge do? Double to a triple at the end of the course. Not my favorite. You can always tell somebody that's lived with a bar knocker before. Okay, so now that we've got um, the lines that are not up for, not, um, up for grabs, we don't have any um, advanced geometry on this course, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some configurations off of this course. Um, with our clean course map. I think I better make one more copy. Um, so let's talk about this opening. We can set our dog anywhere we want. This is These S's mean start jump. So um, we can set our dog anywhere here. And what I would want my dog to do is have its laser beams right there. So my dog would be sitting here. There's his tail. But I've got to cue this turn, three, four, and then I really want my dog to take that jump like that. So that's going to be fun. And the dog is probably going to land more out here and take this jump more like that. They don't actually do these little arcs. So I want the dog to turn pretty tight on landing there. If the dog ends up over here, you know what? I'll bet you a dollar to a donut if a handler didn't get up here or got up too far, you could have some dog take this number four jump and go right into that tunnel. So that's the type of stuff you wanna notice. So I don't want to be behind four for sure when my dog takes it. I want to be up here setting this line. So there's a couple of different things I could do to handle. Um, I could lead out to right here with my dog on my right, give him a turn cue when he's in the information zone, which is immediate, this is here, immediate on, Leon landing, cue that, keep rotating my body and just give a soft go and then straighten myself out and start driving here. I could also lead out to here 
and tell the dog to go right and go. And I would be up a little further. So this would be, I would look at both of those um, handling options. To do the rear, um, I can be up a little bit further to take this tunnel out of play. Um, if I do the pull, I'm gonna be stuck till my dog gets here. But I can still play, if I move at the right time, I'll still be okay. Got it? Um, now I wanna pick a lane to travel in. And because I'm doing another loop here, I want, again, I normally don't handle down the middle. There's usually a side that there's an advantage of when you've got a circle of obstacles like this. So let's take a look at that. Um, this is a tight turn from seven to eight. So I want to have, when my dog hits the end of the dog walk, I want to have my feet going here and I want to parallel this path. So I would release my dog on here. I don't get down here and turn like this, you guys, when the dog is up here. I want to run with the dog. And as soon as those paws hit, pull and say table, and I wouldn't run at the table, I would parallel the path. And then I would get myself up here while the judge is counting, five, four, three, two, one. And I would use a pull cue and, and I would not pass that jump for love nor money, number seven. The pull cue would be done actually a little bit closer here. I don't, I wouldn't do it in the middle of that bar. And then I'm gonna, I, I want the dog to go straight. So I go straight and look, that trap jump is right in my way. If I'm giving the dog green light verbals, this is all about how fast your dog and how fast you are. So if you, um, I would not layer this jump because of my serpentine training. So I've been talking to students a lot about the difference between handling decisions handling decisions for the sake of handling, handling the decisions that are made for the sake of training. So because when I put an obstacle between my dog and I, I want my dog to take it, I, and if I'm in serp position, that position would mean take it, and I would be here, I would opt not to do that. Can I layer? That's what it would mean if you ran, if your dog was doing this row and you ran here and, and put an obstacle that is never taken in between you. I will layer, but I won't layer a jump from cert position. It's like promising chocolate ice cream and then giving vanilla. I'm not going to, I, I, I wouldn't do it. I would run on this side of the jumps only so wide. If I was, uh, my layering has, there are certain instances on when I will layer and when I won't. So I could be green lighting that dog to that tunnel as early as here. Go on tunnel, go on tunnel, go on tunnel. But because I have this lane change over here, because we know that I'm going to do, uh, 16, 17, 18, and 19 on my right side. And I know that I'm doing 10 and 11 on my left side. I have to know how I'm going to change um, uh, sides. And actually, I have to change sides twice because this is an S. There's so much you could do with this course. That's why I, I chose it. This running it is, 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 is again, pretty civil. So I would again release on a here. I would, so you guys, some people would, would choose to, once they got the dog, this is so funny that this, this trap jump is here. It's proving problematic because I would want to run right there, of course, just because it's there. So you could do a front cross between seven to eight. The front cross goes on the diagonal line, which is here, sorry. If you weren't over here, if you weren't too close to the A-frame. So you'd probably have to run very close to this jump and then 
peel away. And you've got to know if your dog will hit that contact if you do a 20 foot peel away. So here you're going to be at 12 feet. And then it'll turn into 25 feet because you would have to be here before the dog is here. Otherwise, you're, you, you could run the dog right into that tunnel. Because whatever you're doing when the dog is here, that's the information zone. So you, if you're running as hard as you can in this direction, <laughs> You're not saying it's a super tight turn unless you've got a way to tell your dog you're lying, which I do. Um, so I would rather not risk getting a wide turn here by running in here to get a front cross done and possibly risking missing the A-frame contact and or slowing the dog down as I split off of him. I would choose to do a pull and then rear cross nine. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 14, rear cross 14 to get to 15. And then this is the basic um, simple drive out. So this course is not terribly complex, um, but people would not see this as a trap. This is only 12 feet and they would go running over here to put a front cross in and, and either get an ugly wide turn there. So that would be one place where folks could go wrong. Any questions about this course before I tell you um, some other configurations that it has to offer or some other sequences? Questions? Okay. Oh, I must I mucked it up a little bit. All righty. I want to show you. So imagine that you've set this up or this is set at a place that you rent and you want to see other things to do. That's what I thought maybe we would do tonight. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to identify all of the boxes. Um, and I, I might miss some. So here's a box right here. The A-frame, the dog walk, the um, tunnel, and this box, and this jump here. So if I wanted to practice box handling, I could go across it here. I could go across it here. I've also got a box technically here, 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 and here. So again, if I wanted to practice crossing boxes, I could go that way and that way. Um, there is a box here, one, two, three, four. I could practice going from the, this would be a real good one, turn the teeter around and go dog walk to tunnel to um, tire to jump. And then you've got, you've got your same options that you did here or here. So um, another box would uh, be one, two, three, four, two different tunnel openings. So I could practice crossing this box from the poles to this end of the tunnel. Um, I would have to move my teeter to utilize it. So it, that's, that's up to you. But this, is a, this would be a nice, so this is how I take configurations and then make up courses. So I could go from the poles to that end of the tunnel and then, and then do this box too to the um, uh, uh, tire and then not cross this box, but go from here to here. And then from this jump to this end of the tunnel. So I'm just, I have not looked at this before. I'm just making it up. Um, let's see if we see, here's another box. 
tire here, here, here. I don't know if I identified that. Have I missed any? Let's look at some pinwheels. And then we'll look at wheat pull entries. So this is your classic pinwheel. So I could practice um, serping the pinwheel. So I could change the numbers of the course to one, two, three, four, and stand here, send my dog to one, send him to two, serp three. Can anybody tell me if I would be on takeoff side or landing side of three when my dog is in the information zone between two and three? Takeoff side or landing side? I'm gonna take, take off. off side. Why? Because that's obstacle the four is on takeoff side. That's right. So that means me physically on this side of the refusal line. And then I could, and then I could um, uh, have some fun with this tunnel. So the closest obstacle, well, the logical one to me is here. I could take that jump in three ways. What are they? Anybody awake out there? Bar, refusal line to bar A, refusal line to bar B. But I would never do that, Sandy. You, you guys, you wouldn't. You would go this way if you, if it was, if this was the course. But there may be a day where we got some nutter judge that makes us do that. So how would you do it? You know, would you, would you handle your one, two, three, four? Ooh, this would be so fun. Could you, could you, could you change that line by being here when the dog is going in here and handle your surf different? Do a front cross one, two, front cross between two and three, arm up into four and T-bone that. Or would you do your surf and do a front cross here? So, so this is, you guys, I just thought, and you can let me know what you think about this. I just thought it might be fun to let you know how I get sequences out of um, the courses that I, that I haven't numbered. So that's, that would be if I wanted to practice surfing my pinwheel. I might surf this. If I, again, this is the new numbering class, one, two, three, I might surf this and go to that dog walk. If the dog walk, if it was truly that, if the dog walk was over here, if this was the end of the dog walk, I, I, I would not. I don't like bad approaches. I could practice, um, in fact, you guys, uh, this is another way to handle this course. If I set my dog, I already told you where my, where is that dog? He's here. Here's that dog. Whoops, can you see? Here's that dog. And I could have just played with him and sent him to one and two, step back and run on this side of the dog walk and then done a push to the table. Ashley Deacon did a lecture once at ACE and they got so much good stuff. I should have him do another one um, out of that lecture, but he talked about how often we don't look at the other side of the dog walk um, and how, and, and since then I've looked at it a little bit more. So um, if you had a dog where you couldn't do the lead out or you didn't want to get gummed up in here, you could just run with the dog, shoot him straight out to two, give him the turn cue, turn up here and run on that side. 
Okay. Other ways to handle a pinwheel. So that's with a front cross between, um, well, on this one, it's between uh, three and four. Dog is on the left for one and two. Handler is rotating as the dog takes three and the dog does four, three and four, three technically and four on the left side. So learning how to do front crosses in between jump two and three of the pinwheel. Ooh, ooh, there's four in this one. Never mind. <laughs> one, two, three, four. Usually a pinwheel is three, you guys, but this would be a lovely handling maneuver if you were doing all four of the pinwheel. Let's go back to my clean map where we're just using three. Um, if I was going to do a um, front cross, I already showed you, you could take one, two this way, front cross here. Three is now on your right into that tunnel. Another way, so we've surfed the pinwheel. We've done a front cross in the pinwheel, rearing into a pinwheel. You and your dog could start here. You drive with them and you rear here and then you rear here into the tunnel. See if he'll turn back and do this backside. It, and, then, and then you could do the backside into the pinwheel again. So um, rearing into a pinwheel, rearing, one rear into the peer, pinwheel, two rears, front crossing anywhere you want on a pinwheel and surfing the pinwheel are all classic handling maneuvers that everyone will face doing this board on a pinwheel. So you can um, use this tunnel and you can always move another jump over here too if you wanna to get to some other place. Let's look at the weave pole entry potentials. Boy, they're good. If you had this set up, I would wanna hit that weave pole entry from the A-frame and the jump to the uh, poles. So sometimes you may say three a uh, three jumps isn't enough. You want the dog to be a little, a little bit more jacked up. So you could send to this jump, play with your dog here, rev, 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 rev him up, uh, send him from your right side with a dig, dig, dig over this jump into the tunnel and a go on, go on, go on, and then do your take this jump straight into those poles and work on making this line pretty. Another pole entry would be to go from the A-frame and take the back side of this jump into the pole entry. Another pole entry would be to go tunnel, jump, tire pull, front cross or rear cross. You could send from the A-frame, A-frame going this way now to the tunnel, work these jumps from over here and surf the tire to the poles. Surfing the tire, I, I never practice that. I, um, I think I would avoid it like the plague. Now that we have breakaway tires, it's not nearly as bad. I would never practice surfing a tire if I was the least bit concerned about getting in position. I would only do it if I knew for a fact where surf position past the 50% point, I would say I, I, I would be well past the entire tire. And then you'd have some major D cell to get that Pole entry, and you guys, you can say that. You could say, Sandy, I would never, I would never be that close to the pole entry, so I, I wouldn't do that. You guys, the reason I cram these handling maneuvers down my own throat in sequences, um, in coursework, in practice, is because never say never. Sometimes you are faced. Maybe you're you got out of position. Maybe you got too far up ahead for a pole entry, and now you've got to drop anchor and hit that pole entry. Um, another pull entry would be going from the tire to this jump. 
get another clean sheet of paper for you. Tired to this jump, to these poles. Yeah, and if you wanted a head of steam, you could go tunnel, jump, tire, jump, poles. You could go tunnel, teeter, double. A lot of times if you ask for a wrap on a double, the bar will come down and you'll say, oh, when was the last time I did wraps on doubles to the poles? And then you could work on a push. So your exits from your poles also have to be worked on. You could do a push to this jump or you could do a front cross to that end of the tunnel. Yeah, you could go, you could come a frame, set the line from over here, a frame jump tunnel. A lot of people would get caught behind this wing. They'd run to the, they'd run past the a frame a little bit and then they'd pull up this way and pull the dog off the tunnel or worse, the dog would ignore that they had a lane change and steal the tunnel. The handler wouldn't care because that's where they wanted them to go, right? Wanted. <laughs> and then you could go um, tunnel teeter to the poles. You could go tunnel teeter front cross to this end of the poles. Fun. A frame jump poles. Tunnel this entrance. So maybe go over this jump in here. Uh, move that jump. This jump poles. Tunnel. That's a nice, fun thing to practice. Yeah, this would be fun. This is how many sequences I have in mind when you guys come for your lessons and then we get stuck on four obstacles. Wouldn't this be scary? <laughs> um, you could do table and then go dog walk. Now here's some box handling. If you could, if you could run, ooh, and you're all, See, I hate lane changes when I want to go straight. So this would be, oh, this would terrify me. Uh, that's about my only choice for my path. So if I say here, I'm going to get that. The, I love these situations. They're so fun where anything you do will screw you up. <laughs> So it's just like, do nothing, like hold your shoulders straight, keep your chin aligned down the middle of you, say here, 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 that's close, close would be a good one. But I don't like slowing the dog down. So when you start practicing extreme boxes like this, that's when you get some confidence about passing obstacles. And you could come through here. This is also tricky. When you've got a snug, you've got a tight little box like this, there's not a lot of judges that would do this to you, so don't panic, but I would do it to you. So you're, you're snugged up here, and then you wanna pick up this pinwheel and go into this tunnel, but you're totally lying with your, because if, if you were rear crossing this, you, Sandy would say be on the diagonal. Well, the diagonal is from here to here. <laughs> if you get on that diagonal, your dog's gonna go over that jump. At least he should. You don't want him thinking too hard. You want him doing logical things. So you would have to do your rear cross from a, it would have to be a verbal rear because your path and your position would be telling the dog to turn this way. This is how you get deep respect for what we're asking of our dogs. Yeah. This is something else that's hard. If you were just doing this loop, tunnel, what time is it? Oh, I was losing time. Tunnel, A frame, jump, jump, and then finish on this jump. Because if you get behind, your dog is going to, um, 
go into this tunnel. This is a very unattractive jump on the edge, no wings. The dog is gonna be way more motivated to go to the tunnel and you can't run over here because of, again, this silly trap jump. Even though we moved it a few minutes ago, we would put it back. So I would hang, not drive up to that A-frame and just drive my dog on verbals, not go any further than probably the halfway point of the A-frame, but I would not wanna slam on the brake. So I'd have to travel at a rate of the speed and then, and then say, here, go uh, with a softer here, come jump and then get, get down here. You'd have to be up here when the dog is here. So that's how doing, um, you know, five, six obstacle sequences like this is how you really get to play. This would be hard if you, when you got to the point in the course where you wanted to turn the teeter around, you could go poles, teeter, tunnel, and then go to the tire. This is a fun box to do. Questions? You could do this box too. From the poles, go to this jump to the A-frame, as long as that, as long as that was okay. Um, if you have your dog jump, you, some, let me talk about an A-frame approach thing that I do sometimes, you guys. If your dog went a little wide because he saw this jump and you didn't get this set, like if you pass pole 10, you're not going to be able to parallel this path. And you're going to put just by virtue of traveling to the end of the poles, you're going to put that jump, what I call in play. So say you'd go up a little further than you should have, and your dog does think you want that jump, but you scream and he doesn't take it, but he makes it to there. And now you're taking this jump like this and you start trying to tell the dog to get on that A-frame, um, that's gonna be problematic. This could be the point in the show where I tell people that I am um, traumatized about A-frame approaches, literally, because I uh, did a terrible approach in a class once and knocked my dog's tooth out on the A-frame. That was Brinky. I cried, I was never gonna do agility again for an hour. Okay, so um, what I will do in these situations, if there's, if there's a chance that my dog is gonna have this stupid approach to the A-frame, is I would stop moving forward, not suddenly, I would eke into it, and I would lean forward with my arm and help the dog know to finish that. I wouldn't slam on the brakes, but I'll T-bone this line a little bit with my, with my body so that when the dog takes this jump, he's not invited to come this way. I push him. I, he's coming like this, and I just start pushing on his line just a little. I just need him to come out here a little bit to get a safer approach. Same thing if the judge was having you go from the table to the dog walk, I would never put my dog on the dog walk from that table. This is something those of you, if you're novice and you rent fields and stuff, you need, you gotta take responsibility for not asking your dog to do things like that. So your choices, if it was the table, is you could just stand here. Remember this term, make yourself an obstacle not make yourself an obstacle for dinner or breakfast, but make you become an obstacle. So you can release the dog to here close and then wrap them around you. If this was a jump, you could again, just run to that spot. I, I have a spot on the ground that I envision that I need the dog to hit. So it's like, there's my base or my dinner plate or my trip wire. And I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking about getting the dog from the table to the dog walk. I'm thinking about delivering the dog to this um, entrance spot. All right, questions. We've only got five minutes. I got a clean map. I have a novice question for you. 
Sure. On a double, if you knock both bars, do you get two deductions? No. <laughs> In the higher levels, you'd be, no, on all levels, you'd be, I don't know if it's all levels, all venues, but AKC and USDAA, well, no, that's not true either. Um, in AKC, you cannot have a bar down at any level. In USDAA, there are some games that are by points and you can have a knock bar and still qualify if you get enough points by gathering up other obstacles. They're, they're games where you're making up your own course, your own strategy. So you can, yeah, knocking bars. This is a master's excellent course. And if you knock anything, you're out, disqualified. Anybody else? Are you sleeping? Pat, you got anything? I'm thinking about 50 other uh, wheat pole entrances. Oh, <laughs> tell me some. Okay. Um, tire, uh, or I was doing this at Jen's today. Um, uh, the panel, 14, 9, whatever it is, uh, I probably moved the tire out of it to the, that end of the weed poles, the far oh, end of the weed poles. jump to that end? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I love to do a jump where the tire is. Again, I wouldn't use the tire to the 15 end. Coming this direction? Yep. Yeah. So Pat did this to me. <laughs> mean. Pat, Pat, when Pat and I are together, we like to do, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do that? And she had the, the jump there and it was a send to get the dog to the poles that direction or that direction. And it was hard. I didn't get it the first time or the second time. Maybe not. Right, did. But her dog did, yeah. Yeah. We all say we want Pat, Pat White weave poles. I worked on it today. Um, be nasty to go from this tunnel to the poles. Yes. Yes. So you have to crowd that. You'd have to crowd them to get around that jump. Or from the dog walk to that jump to the weave poles. To this jump. Yep, I'd move the the dummy jump out of the way. Which way would you take the jump? Either way. Well, you well, couldn't really, you couldn't take this as a 180 because of that tunnel. Oh, sure you could. <laughs> That's only four feet. I mean, you could if you called the dog and redirected. Yeah. It's like cheating. Or how about a frame backside of fourteen nine to the weave poles? Yeah, if that jumps. you may have said that one. I'm not sure that that is legal spacing, but I, I uh, that would be that's a good one. Yeah, that would be fun. Okay, we're just sick warped people. A frame to backside or A frame to onside to poles. Uh huh. And you could leave the dummy jump, but just move it closer to toward the tire. Yeah. So, you guys, is this helpful to look at? Here's another. Here's another good box one dog walk to this jump yep and and you guys if i was doing that i would do it with the dog on my right and my dog on my left and re and remember i don't like to travel in the middle of boxes so if i really wanted to handle this the way i wanted like if i was going to go dog walk this jump poles that'd be good um i would want i would need an independent dog walk because I would not want to have to run here, put that T 
table in play. I'd want to be able to hang back, have my dog here with me here to create this line. And then I would, and then I would also do it where I ran past. So now my dog is here and I am here and I have front crossed. Now my dog is on my left and I'd want to travel on this side of the box. This is the box. This is one side, two sides, three sides, four sides. So this is what we, this is what we mean by a box. And whenever you're crossing a box, you're passing obstacles. This box. I use box principles a lot as for handling. There's a box. Andy, I've been just want to say to everybody, it, it's, you know, I've been doing agility as long as you have, but it's just mind boggling how working in these configurations has opened my eyes. Oh, cool. That's good to know. Me too. Me too. I, um, I love, find, it's like word find for me. And, um, and it just gets clarity so much quicker. Well, I always know we talk about first choice handling. I always know how I want to handle a box, a pinwheel, a 180, a 270. And I practiced all those ways. So then if the obstacles are angled, and this is what I find with the novice students, that it's hard for them to see them. Um, but if you look, if you spend a little time, you know, and think of it like a like a puzzle. It's not, it's, it's puzzle stuff. It's not agility. And then you can practice in any setup. That's what I want people to be able to do if there's somewhere where there's some, op, you know, some obstacles, they can find things to practice. Mm -hmm.